Okay, start some start now. Okay, so we were looking at uh, various aspects of uh, simultaneous substitutions, and we showed that substitutions, uh, the set of substitutions, which I think uh, for a given signature omega, I call it as S omega V, I guess somewhere, um, somewhere. Okay, uh, I can't immediately find it, but. Um, so, uh, for in any algebraic system of course, uh, one of the most basic things is uh, actually um, equation solving, it does not matter in what branch of mathematics you are talking about. Uh, after the basic operations, the, f the next thing to do is to do equation solving and uh, unification is essentially like equation solving, I mean uh, what what we are saying is supposing I have two different uh, terms, uh, Herbrun terms, then uh, uh, I look at, I want to find suitable substitutions which make those two terms syntactically identical. Okay. So, if I look at two terms and I am, I am saying that uh, I have two terms S and T and when I say that I unify them, then I am essentially finding some uh, substitution theta, which will ensure that theta S is syntactically identical to theta T. Uh, that is in a sense the same as trying to solve the equation S is syntactically equal to T, where you are looking for essentially term patterns for the variables, so that when you substitute them the two sides become syntactically identical, right. Yeah. So, so, so we'll essentially talk about. Uh, so this is a form of uh, this is a form of uh, if you if you take two terms and want to make them syntactically identical by just substituting uh, terms for free variables. Uh, I mean it's a, you're working all entirely within a Herbrand universe, right? I mean so so you you the only the your value domain is also just terms, syntactic terms, right? So you are saying what kinds of substitutions can I perform for the variables in the two terms uh, such that the two terms become look identical. And uh, there is another process uh, one can think of a, of a, of a process like uh, anti unification, which says that uh, two, two terms look different. What could have been a term so that if you gave separate substitutions to the two terms, you get two different things? So, uh, what I am saying is, so there are two terms S and T, let us say, which which are syntactically different. Okay. So, S is not syntactically different to T. What kinds of terms exist such that, let us say, a, a term U such that if I applied some substitution theta to u, I get s and if I apply some other substitution tau to u, I get uh, let us say t. So, this is Supposing so, th so this is a process called anti unification. One thing, of course, is that in the case of anti unification, um, uh, uh, you can always uh, just have a single variable x and say that that's that's an anti unifier. You know, you do an appropriate substitution for x, you get s. Some other substitution for x, you get y. Uh, you get t. Okay, I mean that, but you can ask a more subtle question what is the 
most specific kind of term u that you can find, which preserves all the commonality of structure of S and T and then what is the most specific kind of term for which if you apply to some minimal substitutions theta and tau, you will get S and T, I mean that is that is one thing. So, the, the, that is the anti unification of course, is more useful in the anti universe, uh, we will worry about unification in the current universe. Yeah. So, so which is essentially like uh, which is essentially like equation solving, but we will generalize it further. So, let us just say you got n different terms okay, and you are looking at some kind of substitution. Uh, remember that free variable substitutions are length and depth in non decreasing. right? So, you are looking for some substitution theta such that theta t 1 uh, theta t 1 is syntactically equal to theta t 2 is e syntactically equal to theta t n. Yeah. So, so this is like generalizing the concept of equation solving uh, to unify n terms. Yeah. So, at the moment we will just regard this as simply an interesting problem to solve. Yeah. I mean that's so, and many of you may have actually uh, come across these things before in uh, uh, other areas like uh, for which unification is very useful in addition to logic programming namely, uh, uh, namely things like uh, type assignment in uh, functional programming languages and uh, finding the most general or principal type scheme uh, for a for a type uh, for a lambda term in which the types are not predeclared uh, principal polymorphic uh, type scheme let us say yeah but uh, we let's let's look at this as a problem from which we can go on to logic programming so there are here are some basic things for uh, for terms the depth size subterm and uh, there's a peculiar thing that I've defined called position. So I mean, you so we look at a term as a abstract syntax tree. Uh, so you take any tree. Uh, I can uniquely name the nodes uh, by a position, uh, which is a string uh, drawn from n star. Yeah, where the root position is uh, the empty string. And uh, and uh, as you go down the tree, uh, you prefix uh, a current position. So, for example, if I have if I have a f a, f a, f a function like this, um, then uh, if I have a term like this, then at the root position I have f. At position one I have t one. At position n I have t n. Now, supposing T 1 is of the form G of some u 1 to u m, uh, then at position 1 I have G, at position 1 1 I have u 1, I have the root of u 1, at position 1 m I have u m and so on. So, we can uh, define positions uh, in a tree also uh, in this uh, as, as strings over uh, the naturals based on the array T. Yeah. Okay, and then there are symbols at the root position. There is a notion of subterm. Uh, so the notion of subterm is of course obvious. So our position, um, this this position uh, has a uh, is a string, right? So it's a it has a prefix ordering. So I can talk of a position p, which is a prefix of a position q on a tree. And essentially, if you take the subtree rooted at p, uh, the subtree rooted at q is a subtree of the subtree rooted at p. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so I have a subtree relation like this, a proper subtree relation like this, which uh, does that. But I think I made. Uh, it's quite possible that I made a mistake somewhere. But we'll when we come to that, I'll let you know. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so we'll talk about. Uh, so let's let define some basic things. So we'll say a non-empty. Yeah. Then union was the concatenation operation. Which.
Which union? In the position third case. Oh no! Here, this 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 is this for any for any term t, uh, pause of t is the set of all positions uh, that are valid, uh, that are there in that term. That's all there is. Yeah. So the concatenation is here. This i dot pause of t i. Yeah. That that dot is a uh, concatenation operation. Yeah. Uh, have I put the prefix here? Uh, ah, okay. So here's where I made the mistake. Uh, here it should be okay. So t. So for any term t and a valid position p, which is a string belonging to n n star, uh, I'll t with this vertical thing subscripted with p is a subtree rooted at p. Yeah, uh, so it's uh, so what is if p is a prefix of q, then essentially what we are saying and p and q are valid positions in T, then essentially what we are saying is T the subtree rooted at the position q would be a proper subterm of the subtree rooted at position p. I mean that's the correction that needs to be. Made. Uh, this is the subterm really. This is the proper subterm relation. Yeah. And uh, ST of T is the set of all subterms, set of all U such that U is a subterm of T. Uh, in particular, the subterm relation is uh, reflexive. So, T itself is a subterm of itself. Yeah. That is um, Okay, so here, uh, so here is this. This mistake needs to be corrected. Okay, so we'll talk about unifiability. So a non-empty finite set of terms t1 to tn is said to be unifiable if there exists a substitution theta such that theta t1 theta makes all of the terms look alike. Yeah, uh, and of course all substitutions apply only for free variables. Yeah, so. So actually, it's a good idea to if if we had bound variables and so on, in a, even in our term language, which is quite possible, uh, if if you consider things like summations and so on and so forth, uh, then uh, of course we, what what we should say is that this is alpha equivalent to, I mean, so this equivalence, this syntactic equivalence will be alpha equivalence and not pure syntactic equivalence. So then we would say that uh, theta is a unifier. Yeah. Um, here are some simple examples. Let f and g be distinct binary operators and x, y, v and w be variables. You, so, you take f of x, y and f of v, w, they can be unified by the substitution theta which for example, x for v and y for w is one, one possibility. Um, they can also be unified by theta inverse uh, in which I invert the domain and the range. Yeah. Uh, which is possible in this case uh, when the substitutions are what are known as pure variable substitutions, yeah, uh, where a variable is replaced by a variable and not by a complex term. Yeah. So then theta inverse is v for x and w for y that, that also will work to unify them. So in that sense theta can be regarded as some kind of a solution of this equation f of x y syntactically equal to f of v w. Right. Um, for any three terms R, S and T, we can take f of x, y, f of v, w and you can unify them by this substitution you know, which gives you more complicated substitutions. I take g of s, t for v, g of s, t for x, f of R, R for w and f of R, R for y and I can unify them. So basically what you are saying, so the equation solving, it is possible that there are, uh, there is more than one solution, there, are, there could be a large number of solutions. And um, in certain cases of course like this, this is a peculiar case when you want to take, um, when you want to make uh, x, basically x, x to be the same as y, what kind of substitution will you get. Yeah? So if I take x for y then uh, I, I, get, I get them both syntactically identical. So, uh, so f of x x is of course an instantiation of f of x y is right it is a like a particular case of f of x y even though x is a variable right. 
So, and then uh, if I take two terms f of x y and g of x y then they cannot be unified under any circumstances. So, what this means is that this equation solving is as uh, as doubtful I mean. So, it is possible that there are no solutions uh, to this equation solving process yeah because of the fact that f and g are distinct binary operators you can never make these two terms look the same by merely by doing substitutions. Right. If I take f of x y and f of y x uh, they cannot be unified by rho I mean we saw previously that they can be unified by this x for y, but they cannot be unified by um, rho which switches uh, which exchanges x and y for example. So, it does both x for y and y for x. Uh, because in each case when you apply this rho to this these two uh, you will get you will get different terms yeah so that's so this is the simplest way of looking at uh, unification how you have to be sort of careful in unification yeah okay now um, so if you look at this uh, if you look at these unifiers so there is a certain sense in which uh, this theta and theta inverse are more general than let us say this tau yeah. So, what, what, what happens in the case of tau is um, it makes uh, it makes a solution far more specific by int, by using uh, by using greater structure than is absolutely essential. I mean when you have a simple variable there uh, you can allow for further substitutions to be made later which make it more specific. Whereas, if that variable has to be is replaced by some term unnecessarily then you are actually committing it to uh, far more specific uh, substitution than is absolutely essential right. So, what, what we are so if you were to take this so this for example, the g s t for v as opposed to x for v is this g s t for v is a very specific commitment you know which basically uh, whereas x for v if you do the substitution x for v at some later stage if you have to do if you have to do uh, uh, replace that x by g s t you could still do that with another substitution. So, there is some kind of minimum replacement that you do to make the two terms equal right that minimum replacement that minimum replacement is such that it makes the minimum amount of commitments to a structure yeah. So, in that sense this theta and this theta inverse uh, are more general than let us say this g s uh, than this tau or oh, similarly f r r is a very specific commitment which uh, which makes it very specific yeah. So, the, so if it had been um, if it had been f f z w uh, f y z for example, where y and z are variables that would be more general than f r r or it will be more general than f r s for example. Yeah. So, there is a notion of generality of unification which essentially is uh, is comparative yeah. So, a certain substitution theta is at least as general as another substitution tau and uh, we will say that theta is at least as general as tau. Uh, if there exists a substitution chi such that tau is obtained from theta by applying chi yeah by doing a composition of substitutions yeah. So, then uh, so then as you do more and more substitutions you are likely to become more and more specific in your, uh, uh, in, your in the term uh, you you constrain the term structure more and more yeah. We would say that theta is as general as tau if theta and tau are, e, are each as general as each other yeah. Uh, so, uh, this this is something that typically happens uh, can happen because of the fact that you are using different sets of variables in the substitution yeah uh, rather than um, and so therefore, 
uh, in general uh, if theta is at least as general as tau uh, what you expect is that uh, for any term t uh, in which you apply theta and t uh, the resulting terms uh, theta t and tau t will differ at most in the names of variables yeah that is otherwise they will have the same structure they will differ at the leaf nodes in terms of variables yeah. Okay, we would say theta is strictly more general than tau if uh, uh, theta is more gen uh, is at least as general as tau but is not equal to it is not as general as it. Okay. So, this generality relation is a preordering uh, so in the sense that it is a reflexive and transitive relation um, and uh, this uh, this uh, equally general equally general relation is an equivalence relation yeah it's uh, it's reflexive transitive and symmetric um, the strictly general strictly more general is an irreflexive and transitive relation so that's yeah so we look at it this way so now so what you have is you have this given some terms and given some substitutions you have a notion of more general which is essentially uh, if you quotient it on that tilde equivalence basically you got a partial ordering relation on the set of all possible substitutions yeah so there is an ordering there is a partial ordering on the set of all substitutions uh, and uh, we can always look for the highest element the most general element in this ordering yeah that's and that's what we are looking at so let T uh, capital T is consisting of a set of terms T i be a unifiable set. Oh, by the way, we know that some of these sets of terms may not be unifiable. So, let us take a unifiable set and a substitution theta is called a most a most general. Remember, it is a most, it is not unique because there are other there could be others which are equally general, yeah, and which, which are still different from theta. So, a substitution theta is called a most general unifier of t if for each unifier tau of t there exists a substitution rho such that tau is rho composed with theta yeah. So, if it is possible to uh, if every other substitution which unifies this set of terms can be obtained from theta by doing a further substitution then you would say that you got essentially a most general unifier yeah. Okay. Uh, so, given a set of terms uh, if it is unifiable then there is a most general unifier yeah somewhere in that in the uh, somewhere in that partial ordering of uh, unifiers uh, of substitutions you would find some some unifier and it could be a most general unifier. If there if there are two most general unifiers then they must be equally general yeah and uh, and if they are both equally general then they essentially differ in variable namings so if i do a variable re uh, variable renaming uh, i should be able to get one from the other that's uh, so that's what uh, that's what this last property says so there is what is known as a pure variable substitution row uh, in and if, if rho is a substitution which just replaces variables by variables then there is also a rho inverse uh, usually uh, unless unless rho is of the form 0x0y right I mean this shouldn't happen if the domain and range are equally numerous then a row inverse might exist right and notice that uh, um, a substitution like this makes uh, makes a term more specific than a substitution in which uh, I have different variable names for each element of the domain yeah this 
actually collapses two variables and therefore imposes a certain syntactic structure which is more specific than this because this can be obtained from this by another substitution like this right so i mean so so the existence of row inverse is not guaranteed even for pure variable substitutions firstly secondly the generality is important yeah okay so so here i have uh, so i have loosely said that you, basically there should be a variable renaming uh, what, what we are essentially saying is if they are both equally general then they differ at most in uh, in the names of the variables but there is a one to one correspondence between the variables occurring in one and the other with respect to the position so that positions are preserved right that otherwise you would have you would have certain collapsing identifications like this like this z for x and z for y so what we are saying is that when if theta and tau are both equally general then not only do they differ only in the variables but variables basically means leaf nodes uh, the labels on the leaf nodes of the abstract syntax trees but there is a one to one correspondence between the positions of the leaf nodes at which the variables occur between one tree and the other and that position is preserved that position so there is an isomorphism there between the leaves which has to be preserved yeah okay right uh, so this is our notion of positions and there is some notion of a, a root symbol at a position uh, these are some functions that we will define okay so one thing of course is that the set of positions for any term is non empty and there is always a root position for example and the subtree rooted at that root position is the, is the term itself uh, and this uh, this is just to lift it from individual terms uh, to sets of terms yeah so this for a set of terms t i am looking at all the positions that are common to all the terms in the tree yeah okay so um, so so in the process of unification essentially uh, requires that we we compare these two trees in some order we traverse from the root and compare them right so if the root symbol uh, of the of two trees is different uh, in the sense that they have there is some function symbol they are not not a variable symbol but a function symbol there uh, you can uh, then uh, and if the two if two function symbols are different of course the two trees are not unifiable and if the two trees are not unifiable in a set consisting of many trees then that set is not unifiable yeah okay so given a set t of terms also viewed as a set of abstract syntax trees the disagreement set of t is defined as uh, the subterms rooted at some position q such that for all prefixes of q the the two trees uh, the this all the trees look identical okay for all prefixes pre preceding q uh, the trees look identical and um, and it there is a disagreement if at position q there are at least two trees which have different symbols rooted at q at position q yeah so this is so this is the proper prefix relation um, so one thing one standard thing that most uh, most logic books use is that they do not actually look at them as abstract syntax trees but they look at them as terms involving terms involving parentheses i mean you can think of yeah uh, supposing i have this okay uh, uh let's say i have a set consisting of just these two terms uh, where i have not specified what the terms t1 to tn are and what the terms u1 to un are but 
uh, basically the idea is what you can do is uh, they since they represent it always in prefix form with parenthesis and so on and so forth. You can just look upon it as doing a traversal from left to right of the symbols yeah and looking at the looking at essentially a leftmost disagreement yeah uh, a left so but what this uses is uh, something that goes beyond our uh, this uh, prefix ordering because our prefix ordering is not a total order but actually any order which is consistent with the prefix ordering is sufficient to get a leftmost disagreement. But uh, I prefer to use this prefix ordering because uh, there is absolutely no reason why we should look at it as through a leftmost disagreement. We could even start looking at it from the right and look at a rightmost disagreement. Sometimes that might actually be more beneficial, but I would not do that. But in principle at least that possibility does exist. Yeah. Okay. So, so then what it means is that you take any total ordering. So, if you want to take the get the leftmost uh, uh, leftmost disagreement, uh, basically you take any total ordering consistent with the prefix ordering, yeah, uh, and such that the left sibling precedes the right sibling in any uh, at any level, yeah. So, if you have this, if you have this total ordering then you can compute what is known as a disagreement set and in, in particular this will compute the leftmost disagreement set. Yeah. Uh, this is actually uh, okay. So, I have written this in essentially some kind of functional style, uh, uh, but uh, basically what we are saying is you start at a position, uh, start at the root position and start uh, take the set of all positions that are common to all the trees. Uh, all the terms and if the root positions are all the same which is what this this is a cardinality of the set of all root symbols at position p yeah yeah if that set is has a cardinality of 1 which means that all the root symbols are identical yeah uh, then uh, then what you do is you take the next uh, minimal position that is available in the set of common positions and uh, and look at all the trees and look at their dis, uh, look at whether they have the, uh, they disagree and so this is essentially recursive on this yeah uh, it says it's essentially looping on this till you find a minimum position when there is a disagreement or uh, which which will give you a position p at which there is a disagreement so you take the entire set of terms at that position rooted at position you take all the sub terms rooted at that position p and that is your disagreement set. And because you are using a left to right ordering uh, essentially you will get the leftmost disagreement uh, when you look at it in this fashion. Yeah. Um, so, this just computes the disagreement set. Um, so, this is uh, yeah the, ok. So, okay, just let us look at look at these terms. Uh, so, I have taken a set of two terms. Um, here uh, A is a constant, uh, Z is a variable. Uh, so, there is a disagreement. Uh, of course, the root at, at the position epsilon there is no disagreement. So, the leftmost disagreement occurs when between A and Z where let us assume A is a constant and Z is a variable. Yeah. So, that is a disagreement set and the subtree rooted at that is just the subtrees rooted at that are just this a and z. So, this is what the algorithm actually will give you. You could of course, change this ordering um, and still keep it consistent with the prefix ordering and do a rightmost or uh, some other kind of disagreement. Uh, if you do if you try to look at it from the rightmost then of course, what the disagreement you will get uh, is somewhat deeper right. Uh, so, at epsilon they are both the same, at 3 which is the next position they are both the same and then at 3 dot 1 is the first disagreement. So, you get your disagreement set then is g z y yeah. So, that is this yeah. Um, so, that is at a position uh, 
3 dot 1 the string 3 1 yeah uh, position string 3 1. Okay, let us look at this, this is an important uh, um, example, uh, let us look at leftmost disagreements that is convenient. So, uh, of course, so these two are the so there is a disagreement at position 1, yeah. so this one has a, uh, the term g of z, this one has the term z um, and um, this is the disagreement set. Uh, but the important point is that if I take any substitution <coughs> trying to unify these two terms, I need to provide a replacement for z which will make it equal, equal to g of z. But the same substitution is applied to all the terms. So, therefore, there is going to be no possible substitution theta for z which will make theta z the same as theta of g z and that is. So, this is uh, what is known as the Akers check problem and uh, so in such a case actually uh, this set is not unifiable at all right. Uh, so, uh, so, this set of terms is not unifiable and, uh, and this, is, this is a serious problem in fact, this is, this is a problem that makes uh, all prolog implementations. Uh, logically unsound. Uh, what, what does happen is that um, pro, uh, for the sake of efficiency uh, no prolog implementation actually checks before doing a unification whether there is an occurs check problem. They proceed ahead anyway and then there is and then actually you can get unsound. Uh, so, you can get unsound results because of that the occurs check actually makes it unsound. There is another problem in prologue which also makes it unsound and that is the cut problem, but we will not worry about that at the moment that is another efficiency kind of problem. Yeah. So, most prologue implementations actually do not do an occur check simply because it means going deep, too deep down into the tree to find out possibility of uh, occurrence of a free variable. Yeah. Okay. Let, let's look at this set. Uh, okay, f of a x, h of g z, f of b h y h y. Okay, here the disagreement is at position one, and a and b are both constants. There's absolutely no way this place, this set can be unified. Yeah. So s three, this set s three is not unifiable. Here's s four. f of h z x, h of g z, f of g x h y h y again at position 1 there is a disagreement, but then h and g are not the same. So, this this is also again not unifiable yeah, under any substitution of free variables. So, um, so, here are some facts if s prime is a disagreement set of a, uh, of a set s then if s is unifiable then s prime must also be unifiable unless you can unify s prime you really cannot unify s. Uh, if s is unifiable and theta prime is a most general unifier of s prime, then there exists a most general unifier theta of s such that theta prime is at least as general as theta. Yeah. Uh, basically theta prime gives you the least number of constraints required to make the disagreement set look the same and therefore, in that sense it is likely to be more general than the entire uh, than a unifier of the entire set S. Yeah. Uh, I mean it will have less constraints than the entire set S and in fact, what it means is that uh, what, what this actually says is that we will start from theta prime unify with the minimum number of constraints the first disagreement and then traverse down uh, this is a partial order right uh, you traverse down this partial order and keep getting more and more specific as and when you require to be specific. So, your final MGU will be related to any initial MGU of a 
disagreement set by this generality relation. Yeah. Okay. So, so here is a unification algorithm, which uh, which is actually a quite an inefficient algorithm, uh, but uh, it's, it's uh, for us it's just enough to know that it's there is an effective procedure uh, for unification. Okay, so um, we start with uh, we start with uh, the identity or the empty substitution, which is this one. You are given a set, a finite set of terms uh, to be unified. So, there are two possibilities either this set is unifiable, in which case you find a most general unifier, or the set is not unifiable, in which case you report failure, basically. That is, yeah. Uh, okay. So, I do a so this theta prime here uh, is actually a partial unifier. So, you found a disagreement set, you unified that disagreement set. Now, if you apply that theta prime over the entire set S, then some part of it begins to look uh, the same compared to uh, S itself. Yeah. So, th theta prime applied to S uh, is partially un uh, unified version of S yeah. and you have to do further, you have to find further disagreements before you can uh, unify the whole of S. Right. So, uh, so here again we I look at this even though it is an effective procedure I look at it in terms of sets and I look at sets and cardinality of sets. So, basically at any point you have got a certain substitution which is a partial uni, partial substitution to be applied uniformly over the entire set T and having applied it uh, you will check the cardinality of the set so obtained. If it is 1 then it has been unified and the unifier uh, is theta. So, you start with some theta initially of course, you start with the theta which is the identity substitution. Yeah. Uh, so, if uh, R, if theta s has a cardinality of 1 that means, it has been unified and theta is your most general unifier. Otherwise find it find a disagreement in in theta s. So, what so essentially if you are going to traverse this path then you should apply this theta prime to S and then look for a new disagreement. Yeah. Okay. So, you apply you find the disagreement set of theta S and uh, then this portion is the occurs check problem. Okay. You check whether there exists a variable in the disagreement set such that that variable is not free in any term. You remember that z g z the occurs check was because z occurs free in g z. Okay. So, this x that you choose should be a variable that does not occur free in any of the other terms. Okay. Unless the other terms are also x, in which case there is no disagreement. Yeah. Okay. So, disagreement is a set, so you cannot uh, you will have only one occurrence of a variable x. So, if they all differ only in variables, then you will just have as many variables as many distinct variables as there are in this in the set. Yeah. So, if you can find a variable which does which which is there in the disagreement set, but which does not occur free in any of the other terms of the disagreement set, then you perform a substitution. The other thing is that in this notice the other thing is that this, this partial unification is possible only if this disagreement set consists of at most one complex term. All other entities in the disagreement set can only be variables. Right? I mean you take a disagreement set basically what we are saying is that it, it can have a whole lot of variables and it can have maybe at most 
one constant or some complex term, but it cannot have more than one constant or complex term. If it has, this is a set, if it has more than one uh, constant or complex term, then they occur only because they are different, then you cannot unify. Right? So, basically the disagreement set you are making some progress towards unification only if everything there except one possible term is a variable. If you have two different constants or two different other terms which are not variables then your, your unification is going to fail because the terms are not going to be unifiable. So, in fact, this term actually will be unique, right. If it is unifiable, this, this term t, if it is just a variable, then there is no problem. But if it is something other than a variable, then there can be only one term, otherwise, it is not going to be unifiable. And which means that you can choose that t for x essentially. And in fact, what you are going to choose is t for all the variables that occur in that. That is what you are going to choose. It is possible to do that right here, but what we are, what I have done is that I have I made it one substitution at a time choice. So, so if there are two variables x 1 and x 2 and a term and a single term t, then what will happen is it will first do a t for x 1 in this iteration. In the next iteration, it will find the disagreement t for x 2 and then make that another substitution yeah so it sort of does it to uh, it does it to sequentially even within the set whereas uh, it can be done in uh, more efficiently yeah okay so what you are going to do now is you are going to just take the existing substitution and compose this new substitution yeah with it and uh, if if this condition is false then essentially you have an occur check failure and uh, the set is not unifiable, right. Okay. Uh, and then you return failure and so on and so forth, uh, but the important thing and the hard thing which I am not going to do is this, uh, which I am going to leave it for you to uh, study. Yeah. Uh, this is the unification theorem, uh, every algorithm has to be justified by a corresponding theorem. And the unification theorem essentially says that the unification algorithm always terminates firstly and uh, it satisfies its post condition. And the post condition is that if S is not unifiable then it reports failure and if S is unifiable then it gives a most general unifier. Yeah. So, uh, I have got the proof here. Put in various claims, but I am not going to go in detail because you, you can go and study it, uh, uh, especially the last case where you are actually checking that if it uni if it does if it is unifiable, then you do get an MGU. You do not get an arbitrary substitution. You do not get an arbitrary uh, unifier. You get a unifier which is most general. That is an important aspect to be proven here. Yeah. Uh, so. So, this is so, 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 so yes, yesterday's lecture and today's lecture actually uh, they look sort of isolated, but we will put them all together. You have to look at it in the context of Herbrand's theorem, model constructions and satisfiability using only terms and how therefore, in uh, you do not need to look for complex models outside uh, the term algebra. Yeah. We will, so we will continue that with when we do the proper justification of logic programming, yeah. We will stop here today.